So I want to talk about connecting those together, uh, connecting play therapy and attachment and, and involving parents in play therapy with kids. Um, so filial therapy is basically we as, as the therapists are demonstrating and teaching child-centered play therapy skills to parents. They don't, and the good news about this for parents is they don't have to learn to do it like we do as the therapists. They just have to learn to do it for their child. For us as therapists to really be competent in play therapy, we need to know how to do it with every child that walks in the door. For a parent, you only need to know how to respond to your child in, in these situations. Um, and so we're, we're talking about four specific skills that, that we teach parents. So the four skills that we're talking about parents being able to understand uh, for, for play therapy is structure, reflective responses, child-centered play, and limit setting. Structure is, is, I think, really the simplest of these. Structure is about how do I set the expectations to the child of what's about to happen. And, and the way that this kind of training, it's occurring to me that I, I should have like put in three or four slides before this. Uh, so the, the process that I have that, to go into filial therapy, uh, I always meet with the parents first. I, I don't ever see the child first, maybe in very rare circumstances, but my, my procedure is very much to see parents first with the child, without the child present, get a developmental history, understand from them what their goals are, and in that, I'm really listening for, for how aware they are of their own role in their child's behavior and, and what attempts have been made before. What, what's, is there a kind of an intuitive understanding on their part for attachment? Um, and and you know, so I ask them questions about, you know, depending on age, we're, we're talking about developmental history, temperament history of the child when the child was born, um, early years, connection, uh, separation, how did they handle being dropped off at daycare on a regular basis, um, and discipline strategies that are used in the house, um, and depending on what kinds of situations we're talking about, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go in different directions. The, the main situations that I see for kids are anxiety, uh, acting out, defined very loosely, um, and divorce adjustment are, are the main three categories that I, that I see kids for. Uh, so when we're talking about anxiety, um, mood, regulation issues, um, so how do you talk about emotions in your house? Um, what, how comfortable are you expressing those things? You know, to what extent do you identify with those emotions for your child? Because uh, a lot of times parents that have anxious children are also anxious sometimes themselves. Uh, and so, you know, I can't soothe my child's anxious energy if my, if my energy is, is at the same place. Um, so, so sometimes we'll talk about that. Uh, when, we're, when we're talking about acting out behaviors, um, then I, I want to know a lot about what's been tried before uh, to, to stop this behavior and give them some, some psychoeducation about appropriate, positive discipline strategies and things like that. Um, divorce adjustment, obviously, is its own uh, category of, of interventions because you see behaviors in, in lots of different directions. Um, so in, in the first session, I'm getting information from the parents, educating them about different, different approaches to play therapy. What is that? Uh, some literature that I can send with them. And then I always see the child first um, alone, typically in a non-directive kind of setting uh, or from, from a non-directive model. And then very quickly, if we're doing filial therapy, I want to get parents in to observe a session so that they know what it looks like. And then after they've observed a session, then we sit down and start doing some skills training. So the goal then for them is for them to be able to go home, or not that day, but eventually to be able at home to set up a 20 to 30 minute special playtime with their child and have that as a therapeutic experience for, for the child. Uh, and, and parents a lot of times love this because it's something that equips them with something that they can do proactively. 
I don't have to bring my child to therapy for the next five years. I don't have to pay for therapy for the next five years. Uh, even if they have insurance, a lot of times you know, they've got a deductible to meet and everything else. So you know, child therapy can be pretty cost prohibitive. So um, seeing this as like a eight to 12 session model, roughly maybe up to 15, uh, depending on how quickly parents catch on and, and their own comfort level with this process. Um, it, it's intended to be a fairly brief intervention that then equips the parents with the knowledge and the skill to be able to take it from there and, and check in from time to time. Uh, so the, the structure skill that we're talking about is what do you say at the beginning of the process? Um, what this looks like is you know, there's typically what we set up at, at, at home depending on what kind of space they have is you know either on a big rug or a blanket somewhere they've got a selection of toys available no batteries in anything you know, the, we're, we're specific on, on what kinds of, of toys we're selecting um, and there's not really time today to go into all the description of, of what toys you select and all that kind of stuff. Um, if, you're, if this is something that you're interested in doing, I would encourage you first to do a training in child-centered play therapy because you've got to have those skills really strong first before you can start any kind of filial therapy because um, you're basically training the parents to do the child-centered therapy. So th that's where you start with your own skills. Uh, so structuring typically is Okay, Morgan, that's my daughter's name. We have 30 minutes that we're going to have a special play time. And during that time, you can play with these toys that are here in lots of different ways. So I'm starting it very open. I'm not starting out with any kind of rules that I'm setting, which is a very intentional philosophical piece for child-centered play therapy. Um, because I, I want what happens to come from the child, not from the artificial boundaries that I've put in place. Um, and so that's, that's the main structuring piece. And then the other structuring on the other end is that we give a five minute warning and a one minute warning when, uh, before time is up. <coughs> Excuse me. So that the, the child has an ability to prepare for the end of the, end of the special play time. Reflective responses, frankly, I believe is the hardest thing for parents to learn sometimes, but is absolutely the most essential. <laughs> Uh, knowing reflective responses has saved me as a parent in so many situations, I can't even tell you. Uh, so reflective responsiveness is basically, I'm putting language to what's happening for the child. If, if they're playing with something, and, and I'll, I'll show you some, some examples of that in a minute. Um, if, I'm, if, if the child's playing out a scene, I'm narrating what they're playing. And in a lot of ways, like, you know, sports broadcaster is, is telling us about a game as we're watching ESPN. Um, and we could sit there and watch it ourselves. But it's, it's so much more informative and engaging to have somebody putting language to what's happening, right? You may watch football or soccer or basketball or whatever. Uh, and, and in the same way, there's, a, there's something different that happens for a child in the play process when there's someone that's narrating and, and intentionally commenting, oh, so that person's going in here that person's really excited that this is happening, or, oh, it's time for them to go to bed now. They're, they're asleep. And, and it takes a lot of practice to get comfortable doing this. It's, it's one of those things that can look really easy as you, as you see somebody do it. Um, but it is incredibly awkward the first few times that you try it. And, and for parents, even, it can be really awkward and uncomfortable. So I think it's great for us to be able to normalize that for them. Uh, that it was incredibly hard even for us to get comfortable being present with, with kids in that way. Um, and, and so there's, there's several elements in the reflective responsiveness that if, if you do a, an intensive child-centered play therapy training process that you would learn you know, the, do's and do <coughs> excuse me, the do's and don'ts of, of how you respond in that way. Uh, but it, but in, it's very much focused on putting language to what's happening in the play and what's happening for the child. Um, and specifically around emotional experiences and emotional um, components of, of what's happening in the play. For child-centered play, uh, th this component of it is very much just about the parent being able to let the child lead. You're not asking questions. You're not making suggestions about what's happening. 
um, you are um, you're following the child's lead, and the child's the director of the process, and you are an actor, basically, is, is what, we're, what we're telling them. And finally, limit setting is a very specific kind of structured way that we teach parents how to put boundaries down when, when, when they're needed. Uh, and this is another one of the skills that has saved me as a parent in many ways. So limit setting is basically a structured response of first and foremost starting with an acknowledgement of, of what the child's feeling, what, what's happening. You really, really are having fun in that sand and you love watching what happens when you throw it up in the air and it falls back down. This, I get to say this about 10 times a week. Uh, <laughs> but during our special play time, sand is not for throwing. You can choose to pour the sand or you can, with, with this, or you can choose, you know, there's lots of ways that you can move, choose to move the sand around, but, but throwing is not a choice. So I'm starting with the connection and the attunement message of, I understand this is what you want, this is how you feel, this is what you're trying to do, but this part's not okay. But here's other choices. You know, it, it's a very intentional redirection message. And then we talk, we coach parents through what to do in a few situations where kids are like, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, we have responses for that too, <laughs> that are really important. Um, so with these, with these four skills, hopefully it would make sense, uh, and it make, makes sense, let me know if you have any questions about how attachment security is fostered here through attunement and that the mode of learning here is, is through in, in the connection to the symbolic play in the child-centered process. So child-centered process and the filial therapy process are very much built around symbolic expressive play that window into the child's perspective into the world and, and how they see themselves, how they see others, uh, which gets interpreted through lots of different lenses. But from, from an attachment perspective, that internal working model of, of how they see themselves and how they see the world. A few of the important pieces of, of this developmentally and, and how we, why we use expressive and symbolic play is that any of us, but particularly kids, can put so many, much, so many more things in metaphor and in story than we can say directly. I can't, as a five-year-old, sit down and tell you that I am terrified because my dad just moved out of my house and I don't know when I'm going to see him again and my mom's crying a lot and I don't understand why and it makes me sad. But I can tell you a story about a dinosaur that's left alone in the woods and doesn't know who's there to take care of him. And, and when you hear that story and, and, you, and you give me words to say, oh, that dinosaur is so sad and so scared. He doesn't know who's going to take care of him. He's, he's, he's looking for his mom and he's looking for his dad and he's calling and nobody's coming. And, and you can see the look on their face that's like, yeah. That's how he feels. And that child couldn't have told you that that's how he felt. One, because he doesn't have those words yet. Um, but kids have their defenses built up to, to, not, to not really know how to, how to open up and say all that, even if they had the words for it. So there's, there's a lot that's safe to express and, and put in a metaphor that, that kids would never sit down and talk to you about, that, that they don't know how to talk to you about. Um, but a skilled adult that's present in the process can help them put language to that in a way that helps organize it in their experience and, and help them learn how to express it, and, and, and even, mo even more importantly, help the adults in their lives learn how to respond to those emotions in a way that match what it is that the child's expressing which is one of my favorite pieces about getting parents involved in learning how to, how to interact with their children and play. Because, but, but then again, if you think about the parent that's having to watch their child tell the story about the dinosaur, a lot of parents can't handle that yet. And kids know it, so they won't play it out in front of their parent. Because there's a part of them that knows, oh, I can't say that yet. Uh, so, so you have to 
help parents get comfortable enough and, and process their own stuff so that then they can be ready to be present for their kids in that, in that kind of expression. Um, sometimes kids will do it anyway and then parents freak out and you don't want to set kids up for that. Um, you, you want to set kids up for playing in, in relationship with a parent that's ready to be responsive. But a lot of times when kids have something to play out, they're playing it out anyway. But once parents become aware, oh, that's what that means when they're playing that out, then you know, that increases their own anxiety and their own sense of guilt and, and other things that are, that are going on. Um, so it, attachment security fostered in, in safety and expression, the parent being able to be a calm presence, or the therapist first being able to be a calm presence. Uh, the space is held by the adult within the context of a trusted structure. I know what to, to expect. I know where the toys are going to be each session. I know what you're going to say when it's almost time to leave. Like, all of this is in the predictability and the safety of, of that kind of interaction. Um, children are empowered uh, when allowed to lead interactions with adults, uh, very much so. Um, whether it be I'm putting you in character or I'm dressing you up as a witch and I'm making you dance or you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways that, that, that kids who 99% of their lives, they, they don't have power over anything. When they have the opportunity to have that kind of power over a parent or over an adult, it's like, oh, I'm in charge here? Oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> And, and amazingly, they, they typically do, not always, but they typically do responsible things with that power. Uh, and if they don't, then you have the limit setting option to, to utilize and, and teach them how to do responsible things with that power. <laughs>